a recap of what we did last time, and I'll also try to correct one of the egregious errors that I made in the previous lecture. So this time, the egregious error that I stated was that if you have an irreducible Coxeter group, then it is not the direct product of smaller Coxeter groups. This is false. Uh, so what I should have said is that like an irreducible Coxeter system is not a direct product of smaller Coxeter systems, but it is possible to have a Coxeter group with some set of simple reflections that can be that is isomorphic to a direct product of smaller groups, where those groups are themselves Coxeter groups, but with like different sets of simple reflections. So this is not really decomposing the Coxeter system, but it's saying that as an abstract group, it can be written as a direct product. Okay, and I won't go into an example of this because uh, I guess even more embarrassingly, this is also like part of the homework, one of the homework problems, so I definitely should have known what I was talking about, but uh, yeah, okay. Anyway, so that's that. And then, okay, the other thing I wanna say before Okay, let me give the recap and then I'll talk about this Matsumoto's theorem that I uh, sent an announcement about and this is related to one of the homework problems. So I guess last time we, uh, we talked about various Coxeter groups like the hyperoctahedral group BN and the affine symmetric group SN tilde. And then uh, I said that the symmetry groups of regular polytopes are Coxeter groups and then I also gave the characterization of finite irreducible Coxeter groups. So this was where we had AN, which is the same as the symmetric group SN plus one. And then there's BN, the hyperoctahedral group. There's DN, uh, there's the dihedral group, uh, I2 of M, and then there are these exceptional cases like E6, E7, E8, F4, H3, H4. I also listed G2, even though that's the same as the dihedral group of order, uh, order 12. Okay, so, there was that, and then I started talking about reduced words. So let me talk more about reduced words now. So I'll say a word over S, or sometimes I'll just call it a word and it'll be assumed that it's over S. This is just a sequence of elements of S. And instead of writing it as a sequence, like with commas, I'm just usually going to write it as a concatenation of letters. And the letters are just the elements of the set S. And a reduced word, or so a, a word, or maybe I should say, OK. If you have a word, then it will represent some element of the Coxeter group, because you just multiply the simple reflections in that order. And you kind of have to get used to passing pa back and forth between thinking of a word as a word and thinking of it as representing an element of the group. Because sometimes I'll want to think of it as a word, where two words might be different as words, even though they might represent the same element of the group. So I'll give an example of this in a second. But a word uh, is reduced, or okay, a word representing some element w in our group w is reduced if it has a minimum possible length among all of the words over S that represent uh, this element W. And this length, so this length of this word is called well, the length of the element w, and it's denoted L of w. Okay. So I gave this example where we can look at S3, and we have our elements. And we have the reduced words. For that element. And then we have the length. Of the element. So we have six permutations in S3. There's one, two, three. Uh, let me say two, one, three. One, three, two. Two, three, one. Three, one, two. And 
three, two, one. So one, two, three is the identity permutation. So it has just one reduced word, which is just the empty word, which I'll write like that. So the length of this is just zero. Then two, one, three. So this is the transposition that swaps two and one. So this is what we were calling S1. And so the length here is one. One, three, two is the transposition that swaps two and three. So that's S2. So this also has length one. Two, three, one is, OK, well, how could I think about two, three, one? I can get it from, uh, from two, one, three by swapping the second and third numbers. And so when you swap the numbers in positions two and three, that's the same as multiplying on the right by S2. OK, so this is the same as if I took S1 and I multiplied it on the right by S2. So this has length 2. And I should say that, maybe just to, to emphasize this, when you take a permutation and you multiply on the right by SI, that's going to swap the numbers in positions i and i plus 1. Alternatively, if you take a permutation and you multiply on the left by SI, that's going to swap the numbers i and i plus 1. So I could also think of this as taking S2, which is this permutation, 1, 3, 2, and I multiply on the left by S1, so that'll swap the numbers 1 and 2. So if I swap the numbers 1 and 2 in 1, 3, 2, then I get 2, 3, 1, which is this. Uh, OK, so similarly, 3, 1, 2 is uh, just S2, S1. So this has length 2. And then 3, 2, 1 is the interesting example that has two reduced words, which are S1, S2, S1, and also S2, S1, S2. And this has length 3. So uh, this theorem that I said an announcement about is called uh, Matsumoto's theorem. I've also seen it called the Tietz lemma, and it's also in, I think in the book, it's called the word property. So this appears in uh, chapter three. So I wasn't going to cover it yet, but then I realized that I sent this problem. And like I did the problem for myself, but I realized that I was implicitly using this theorem, and I didn't realize that this theorem comes later. So I want to like state it so that you have it, so you can use it for the p-set. And then we'll come back to it, I guess, in chapter 3. So Matsumoto's theorem. Uh, OK, so let me start by defining two operations that you can do to a word. If you have a word, and you have two simple reflections that are the same and they're right next to each other, you can just cancel them. So a nil move uh, just deletes some SS in a word. Right, so if I have my word and somewhere along I see there's like some S, S, I can just say, OK, I'm going to cancel those. And then the other move you can do is a braid move. And this will replace uh, some sequence S, S prime, S, S prime, dot, dot, dot. And I'll explain what this is. With S prime, S prime, S, S prime, S, dot, dot, dot where this is the word that starts with s, and it alternates between s and s prime. And the total length here is this exponent m of s, s prime. And here it's the same thing, except we start with s prime instead of s. So for example, if we were in the symmetric group, and somewhere along the line, you know, I'm reading my word, and I see s1, s2, s1, I can replace it with S2, S1, S2, because that's the same thing. So what the theorem says, OK, so the theorem is that any word over S can be transformed into a reduced word. using only nil moves and braid moves. Okay. 
So maybe I'll make a couple comments about this. First of all, there are special braid moves called commutation moves, and those occur when m of s comma s prime is two. So there I'm just saying if you have two simple reflections that commute with each other, and they appear right next to each other in your word, you can just swap them. Yes, Kathy? I think in your, the like bracket below your second braid move, it could be m s prime s? Oh, well, okay, yes, um, although they're the same. Mm -hmm. So the in the definition of the, I mean, I could write this as m of s prime comma s, but they're actually like yeah. equal. So, okay. But I'll, I'll put it like this just to emphasize that these, like, just so that it's visually apparent that these are the same number. Um, right. So that's one thing. The other thing I should say about this is, like, you might wonder, why is this not obvious? Um, and you might think this is obvious because I told you that one way of rewriting the relations that define your Coxeter group is basically to say that, well, you have the relation saying that for any simple reflection s, s squared is the identity. That's what we're basically doing with the nil move. We're saying s, s is the same as the identity. And then there's the other type of relation, which is these braid relations, saying that this thing as an element of the group is equal to this thing as an element of the group. And so you might think, well, okay, obviously I should be able to get from any word to any other word that represents the same element of the group by just doing these moves. And the thing that's non-trivial about this is you might think, well, when I do this nil move, I'm going in one direction. I'm taking an SS and I'm replacing it by the identity. But I don't have like the reverse of this. I'm not allowed in this setting to take nothing and just insert SS somewhere. And so a priori, you might think maybe in order to get from one word representing my element to a different word, I might have to do some moves where sometimes maybe I insert SS somewhere and maybe that helps me like, uh, do other braid moves and maybe like I need that extra flexibility and then maybe I can cancel them later. And the point of this theorem is actually you don't need to do that. You can go from whatever word you're given to a reduced word by just uh, doing these moves and in particular you never have to make the word longer along the way. Yes, Elliot. It's also not obvious that you can get from any word to a reduced word, right? Like... So I guess, um, Well, you should be able to get to a reduced word. Maybe I don't understand why, but I mean, the point is that uh, if you could get to any word, you should be able to get to the word of minimum possible length. I see, okay, okay, okay. Okay. I was just thinking you could have like one word that represents your element that maybe you just can't for some reason like reduce it and make it shorter, um, but you could have like- Oh, oh, I see. Right, okay. Um, yeah, so in, in what this, yeah, another way of saying this is that like all of the minimal words, like the words that cannot be reduced further, actually do have the minimum possible length. Okay. Yeah, so anyway, uh, this hopefully will help with problem six. And uh, yeah, now we can go back to chapter one. Okay, where am I? I just have to find my place. Um, I should look for that table of reduced words. Okay, there we go. Okay, so here let's let's talk about the symmetric group. Um, so here's a theorem. If you have a permutation W in the symmetric group S n, the length of W is just the same as the number of inversions of W. And by inversions, remember, I mean this is just the, the pairs of numbers in your permutation that are out of order. So if I look over here, if I say, like, okay, 1, 3, 2 has one inversion, the 2 and the 3, because they're out of order, and that has length 1. And if I look at 3, 1, 2, that has two inversions, namely the 1 and the 3 and the 2 and the 3, so that has length 2. If I look at 3, 2, 1, that has three inversions, because the 1 and the 2, the 1 and the 3, and the 2 and the 3, and that has length 3. So in some sense, you could say, like, okay, this is kind of fitting in with one of the themes that I want to address in this class, which is to take combinatorial things from the symmetric group and generalize them to Coxeter groups. So here we're saying, like, the number of inversions of a permutation is a very combinatorial thing. You just you have these numbers, and you count how many times 
you have pairs of numbers that are out of order, and this gives an algebraic way of generalizing the Stanley Foxer group. Okay, so here's a proof. So we're going to induct on the length of W. So let S1 dot 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 SK. Oh, maybe I shouldn't. Oh, okay. Let me call them SI1 through SIK. I'm not sure if the camera is picking up those double subscripts. You might want uh, to write a little bigger. Okay. Let S sub I. Yeah, that's not bigger, but um, this is S sub I sub 1. <laughs> And this is S sub I sub K. Okay. So let this be a reduced word. For W. And I'm going to let UJ be the element that I get by just multiplying the first J of these. So it'll be S sub I1 through S sub I J. And here's one place where we have to kind of go back and forth between thinking of words as words and thinking of them as elements. Here, I'm thinking of uj as like an element of the group that I get by multiplying these simple reflections. Um, OK, so if I take uj, this is obtained from uj minus 1. by reversing two adjacent numbers. Right, so all I did to go from uj minus 1 to uj is I multiplied on the right by s sub i sub j. That just swaps the numbers in positions i sub j and i sub j plus 1. And it's pretty easy to check that whenever you swap two adjacent numbers in your permutation, you're either going to increase the number of inversions by one, or you're going to decrease the number of inversions by one, just depending on whether you put the numbers into the correct order or out of the correct order. So in particular, this means that the length of, or sorry, I should say the number of inversions, the number of inversions of uj is at most the number of inversions of uj minus 1 plus 1. But this is for every j, so this would imply uh, that the number of inversions of, well, OK, the number of inversions of u1 is at most 1. The number of inversions of u2 is at most 2. The number of inversions of u3 is at most 3. And so the number of inversions of uk is at most k. But uk is just w. Maybe I should have written this in the reverse order. Uh, okay. And k is just by definition the length of w, because we said this is a reduced word. It has k simple reflections, so that is by definition the length of w. So this is one inequality number of inversions is less than or equal to the length. Uh, now for the, the other inequality, let's let i be a, oh, maybe I shouldn't use i, let's let uh, r be a descent of w. So remember, this just means that the rth number in w is bigger than the r plus first number. And so if I multiply w by s sub r on the right, that's going to remove an inversion. So I'll let v be w times sr. And this is saying that the number of inversions of v is just the number of inversions of w minus 1. Wow, my shoe is covered in chalk. 
OK. Uh, so we have this. But now, OK, we can use induction. We can say v has smaller, oh, maybe I should have said, uh, what am I actually inducting on? Maybe I'm actually inducting on the number of inversions. I mean, it's the same, but OK, whatever. So we're inducting, sorry about that. We're inducting on the number of inversions. The number of inversions of v is smaller than the number of inversions of w. So by induction, uh, by induction, the length of v equals the number of inversions of v. So this means that the length of w is equal to the length of v times sr, right? Because, well, I can just multiply by sr on the right here, and sr is an involution, so w is the same as vsr. And this is at most the length of v plus 1, because the definition of length is it's the smallest number of simple reflections that I need to express my element. And if I can express v using this many simple reflections, then I can express v times sr using, at most, length of v plus 1 simple reflections, because I've just added on this extra sr. So we know that the length of v is the number of inversions of v. And then finally, we know that the number of inversions of v plus 1 is just the number of inversions of w. And so this proves the reverse inequality. OK? OK. Any questions? All right. So let's talk about reflections. Well, I guess we're not talking about like literal reflections yet. We're just going to call them reflections. So a reflection uh, in W or of W is an element that is conjugate to a simple reflection. reflection and W is an element of the group. Okay, so maybe I can ask a question. What is a reflection in the symmetric group? symmetric group, uh, a reflection is just a transposition. Right, and this is just because, uh, well, when you conjugate something in the symmetric group, you don't change the cycle type. So if you conjugate one of our simple reflections, which is like a, you know, an adjacent transposition, you're still going to get some transposition. But you can also get any transposition by conjugating one of these adjacent transpositions just by conjugating, I guess, by the correct element. Okay, so we, we understand what these are now uh, in like Coxeter theoretic terms, what a transposition means. And, okay, so now let me 
Let me actually make a distinction between two types of inversions that we'll consider. So we will let T sub L of little w, so little w is an element of my Coxeter group, and this will be the set of what we'll call left inversions. This is going to be the set of reflections T, such that if I multiply W by T on the left, the length goes down. And similarly, well, T sub R of W is going to be the set of reflections such that if I multiply on the right, the length goes down. So these are, these are called left inversions of W. And of course, these are called right inversions. Okay, so let me say what this actually means in the case of the symmetric group. Um, maybe I can do it down here. So let's say, suppose one is less than or equal to i, is less than j, less than or equal to n. Then uh, for w in Sn, so a transposition ij, which is the same as a reflection, this is a left inversion of w. Uh, if and only if. Okay, well, what would this mean? It means that if I multiply w on the left by i comma j, or I guess I didn't write a comma, i j, then i, the length should go down. So what does it mean to multiply on the left by i j? It means you swap the numbers i and j in your permutation. You take the number i, the number j, and you swap them. And if this is going to decrease the length, in other words, it's decreasing the number of inversions, that should mean that the i and the j were out of order. So this will happen if and only if uh, w inverse of i is greater than w inverse of j. And again, this is just saying that so i is the smaller one here, and this is just saying that it appears, oh wait, yes, it appears later in the, in the permutation. Uh, similarly, so i, j is a right inversion of w, if and only if, well, when you multiply on the right by i, j, what you're doing is you're taking the numbers that are in the positions i and j, and you're swapping them. So what are those numbers? Those are w of i and w of j. So you want those to be out of order in w. So that would say that w of i is greater than w of j. Okay. Oh, maybe I should make a remark. That, uh, well, the length of any element of my Coxeter group is the same as the length of its inverse. And this is just because, well, okay, why is this true? You just write it in reverse. Right, you just write it in reverse. If you have some reduced word for w, and you write it in reverse, you get a reduced word for w inverse. Uh, okay, so what this means 
is the set of left inversions of W could also be understood as the set of right inversions of W inverse. Or another way of saying this is, so that is uh, the length of TW is less than the length of W if and only if the length of W inverse T is less than the length of W inverse. So here's a theorem. This is in the book. Uh, it's called the strong exchange property. I think I will not prove it, but it's in the book. And this says, uh, so suppose you have some word uh, representing W. So suppose you can write W as, say, SI1 dot 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 SIK. Or maybe, should I, okay, I won't use the double subscript. Um, I'll just say S1 through SK. But uh, don't confuse this with the simple reflections that I have in the symmetric group. This is just some Coxer group. And these are just some simple reflections in some order. So this is some word uh, representing W. Possibly with repetitions. Uh, so if I take a left inversion of W, Uh, there, then I can write, so we have, if I take TW, this will be the same as S1, okay, I'll write it this way and explain what I mean uh, for some I. And this is just the notation, meaning you take this word and you delete the SI. So the hat just means delete it. Okay, let's let's do an example of this with the symmetric group. Uh, so consider the permutation two four three one in S four. Then, okay, here's a reduced word for this. Uh, S1, S3, S2, S3. S1, S3, S2, S3 is a reduced word for a two. Four, three, one. So, okay, I made these notes actually like in March. I thought I was going to be like super proactive and like plan my lectures really far in advance. And now I'm remembering I don't actually remember what I was doing. So I have to keep like second guessing and saying, like, okay, okay, like is this correct? So let me just do a sanity check that the number of inversions here is uh, one, two, three. Uh, wait, four, wait, one, two, three, four. Okay, there's the two, one, the four, three, the four, one, and the three, one. So four inversions, and that makes sense because this is a reduced word of size 4, or of length 4. And uh, OK, so let's consider, let's let t be the transposition that swaps 1 and 4. And this is a left inversion of 2, 4, 3, 1. 
because so to be a left inversion again that means that the numbers one and four are out of order which is true one and four are out of order uh, then if I do TW okay so then T oh I guess I I should call this W TW, well, it's just what I get by swapping the numbers 1 and 4 in this permutation. So that's uh, 2, 1, 3, 4. And this is just the permutation. I mean, it's a transposition that swaps 1 and 2. So this is really just S1. And this might be a little confusing because here I said, well, what you're doing is you're deleting a single simple reflection from your reduced word. But really what happened is I said, I took this reduced word and I deleted the S2. And so that gave me S1, S3, S3. But if I have the S3, S3, I can cancel them. So actually what happened is that S2 got deleted and then the S3s canceled each other and I was left with S1. Okay. So here is a corollary of this theorem. Uh, let, okay, do I use double subscripts or not? I do not. So let's let S1 through SK be a reduced word. for some element w in my Coxeter group. Then, if I want to look at the set of left inversions of w, oh, yes. So is that ever used to bound number of elements in the left inversion? Um, Well, okay, so the number of, wait, what do you mean? So, like if that is true, then there can only be so many things, right? Yeah, um, I mean, in fact, well, one upper bound is k. Right. But that's because the number of, oh. Oh, maybe, I didn't, yeah, I have not said this yet. Okay. Um, I will, yeah, I'll get to there in just a second. Yes. Um, okay, then. The left. Uh, the, yeah, so actually you're, you're predicting exactly what I was going to write. The set of left inversions of W is, well, okay, S1 would be one of them. So this is uh, obvious because S1 is itself a reflection. It's a simple reflection, but it is a reflection. And if I multiply on the left by S1, then the length goes down because I can cancel that S1 from that reduced word. But then, OK, the next one should be S1, S2, S1. And then I also want to write S1, S2, S3, S2, S1, and so on. And we just form all of these palindromes until we get to the end, uh, which will be S1, S2, S3, dot, 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 SK minus 1, SK, SK minus 1, dot, 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 S3, S2, S1. And actually, these are all distinct. distinct. So in fact, uh, the number of inversions, or sorry, the number of reflections is exactly the length. So what you were predicting is that um, yeah, the number of different uh, inversion, left inversions, or it's also the number of right inversions, is equal to the length of your element. Okay, so uh, let me prove this. So 
So if t is a left inversion, then, okay, so tw is, well, according to this strong exchange property, I can write it as s1 dot 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 si hat, so I've deleted the si, and then sk. Uh, so this is the same as if I, wait, what did I write here? Oh. Wait, what? Oh, I see. So if I take t, again, it's been a while since I've written this. Uh, OK, so t s1 dot 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 si, si plus 1 dot 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 sk. OK, what am I doing here? This is just t times w. This is just that reduced word. So this is t times w. And it's the same thing. But I'll write it out as like s1 through si minus 1, and then si plus 1 through sk. I've just deleted the SI. Um, so now I can cancel this part. So T S1 through SI equals at S1 through SI minus 1. And that means that uh, so t is what I get by, OK, so I take s1 through si minus 1. And then I want to multiply by the inverse of this. But as you so pointed out, the inverse of this is just what I get by writing this in reverse. So I do si, uh, si minus 1, dot, 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 s1, which is this palindrome that I was writing there. Yes. And do you do the same for right using that? Yeah, yeah. You can. Everything here is for left inversions, but you can just, you know, switch to right, and it's essentially uh, very similar by you know reversing the words, taking the inverses. Right. Okay. So I guess what this is showing is that if I have some left inversion, then it is one of these palindromes that I wrote. But then also I should show that each one of these palindromes is a left inversion. So uh, if I define t, so this is like new paragraph, if I define t to be this thing, this palindrome, then, well, if I multiply it by, I want to show that if I multiply it on the left, multiply it by w on the left, then the length goes down. So tw. Well, OK. You can just trace through this, uh, this computation backward, and you'll find that tw is this. So the length of tw is less than the length of w, because the length of w was k. And here I'm saying that tw can be written as a product of well, this would be k minus 1 simple reflections, possibly fewer if you cancel things, but it's certainly at most k minus 1, so you get this inequality. And that's saying that t is a left inversion. In fact, okay, so I guess this shows that the set of left inversions is equal to this set of palindromes. You might wonder if some of these palindromes are actually equal to each other. They're not. Um, I'll just state that. Uh, so actually, maybe I, okay, I won't go that far. Okay. Actually, uh, 
these palindromes are distinct, so the number of left inversions of W, well, this is also equal to the number of right inversions of W, and this is equal to the length of W. Yes? I think that's actually easy to see in the mass of those right? Using what? The mass of those here. Oh. Um, if you cancel out the equal thing on each side, then you have the sequence of numbers where you can't draw the numbers. Oh, the fact that the palindromes are distinct? Yeah. Okay, yes. I think, right. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, cool. Yeah, you can do the you can do a braid move in the middle. Um, well, I mean, how do you know you can't do like? Are you saying you can't do braid moves like throughout the palindrome? What do you mean? Or I, I guess what are what are you claiming? Maybe I was misunderstanding what yeah, you mean. Yeah, I don't actually. I don't know. I might be wrong, but if you equate two of those strings. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Yeah, if two of them were equal and then you cancel things, yeah, I think you should be able to do something like this to show that you don't. And there's like one braid move in the middle as possible, but once you do that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two. Okay. Swap to a new thing. So I think because you don't need to show that the word that you get from canceling these things is reduced, you just need to show that it's not equal to the identity. Like, let's say, for example, you have S1, S2, S1 equals S1, S2, S3, S4, S3, S2, S1. Uh -huh. Then that would imply something like S2, S3 equals S2, S3, S4, or something like that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. And they would have different lengths, yeah. is what you're saying? Yeah. Right because they would be reduced. OK. Yeah, so anyway, this is true. Uh, so cool fact is that the, the length is the number of inversions, which you know this is sort of what we were saying here, but this is for any coxeter group. OK, so let's talk about descents. So I'm going to let dl of w be the set of left inversions of W that are also simple reflections. And similarly, dr of W will be the set of right inversions of W that are also simple reflections. So this is, uh, these elements are called the left descents. W and similarly these are right descents of W. Okay, so as we've been doing, I will tell you what this means in the symmetric group, but maybe you can guess. Uh, Here's an example. So a, let's talk about right descents, I guess. A right descent of some permutation W in SN is a simple transposition SI. Well, it should be a simple transposition that is also a right inversion, and that just means that if I multiply it by W on the right, or if I multiply W by it on the right, then the length goes down. 
such that uh, but this is the same as saying that the number of inversions of WSI is less than the number of inversions of W So it's really, if you think about it for a second, the right descent set of W is just the set of simple transpositions SI such that the ith number in W is bigger than the i plus first number. Because right? this is what it means for the number of inversions to go down when you swap the numbers in positions i and i plus 1. But this is basically what we were calling a descent earlier. The only difference is that earlier I said a descent of a permutation is a number i such that the i entry is bigger than the i plus first entry. Here I'm saying it's the simple reflection si, but you can kind of you know, associate the index i with the simple transposition si. And similarly, Uh, the left descent set of a permutation is the set of SI such that, well, I can just use this inverse thing. So this is just saying that W inverse of I is bigger than W inverse of I plus 1. state one more theorem from chapter 1, and then I think we'll be done with chapter 1. Uh, and this is called the deletion property. And I'll prove it also. sort of technical, like we're just kind of going through, um, you know, formal things that we have to know, but I think it'll get more fun soon. Um, but anyway, okay, here's the deletion property. If W, okay, so if, if I can write W as S1 through SK, where K is bigger than the length of W, so this would be a non-reduced word. Then uh, I can write W as, so I'll write it like this. So by this I mean take this word and delete SI and SJ uh, for some I and J. Here's the proof. Choose uh, let's choose I maximal so that when I look at the word S I through S K. So it's like a suffix of this word where I only consider going from SI and onward. So that this is reduced. Or wait, do I want to say, no, I want to say not reduced. Sorry, not reduced. So the point is if I took I equals one, I know this is not reduced because K is bigger than the length of W. And so you just say go as far as you can while remaining not reduced. 
Okay, then, well, what does this mean? It means that if I did si plus 1 through sk, this is reduced. So the length of this element, s i plus 1 through s k. And here I'm thinking of, again, this is maybe a little confusing, because here I'm thinking of this as a word. Here I'm thinking of it as an element, so it has a length. But its element is equal to the length of this word, this word. Uh, and this is just k minus i. Uh, and the length of, uh, if I took si through sk, this is less than k minus i plus 1. Okay, so this means that the length of SI through SK is actually less than the length of SI plus 1 through SK. The reason for this is here I have something of length K minus I. And to get this thing, I multiply it on the left by SI. And the point is that, well, uh, the length could not have gone up when I did this, because then I would have equality here. So it must have gone down. So the length of this thing must be less than the length of this thing. Uh, so thus, if we go to the strong exchange property, We can say S sub, oh wait, how did I write this? Yeah, SI through SK is SI plus 1 dot 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 SJ hat dot 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 SK for some J. All right, this is because. I'm using the strong exchange property to say that if you multiply by some reflection on the left and the length goes down, that's what it means to be a left inversion, then it means you must have deleted some simple reflection from your word. So that's what we have here. But then we can just write this as, uh, well, w. So then w is s1 through s i minus 1, si through sk. That's just this. And this is just uh, the same as s1 through si minus 1, and then si plus 1, delete the sj, and sk. And of course, this is actually the same as this thing. Because I deleted the SJ, but you can see I also deleted the SI. Yes, user. So, when you go for when you get that um, inequality with both elements on each side, did you use a parity in the whole morphism last time? Um, wait, when I did this step? Yeah. So I think what I'm saying is just that. Well, like how do you show? Oh, I see. Yeah, I mean, I guess that would follow from the parity thing. Yes. Um, yeah, maybe that's the best way to, to see it. Um, yeah, we have this homomorphism that uh, sends each simple reflection to like negative 1, basically. And so, yeah, another way of saying this is that if you have any word representing like among all of the words representing some element of your group, the parities of the, of the lengths of those words have to be the same. 
So some of them will be reduced and they'll have the minimum possible length. Some of them might be bigger, but they will be bigger by a multiple of two. Okay, but yeah, that's essentially what is being used. I guess that's chapter one. Um, before I start chapter two, okay, are there any other questions up to here? Okay. Okay, let's talk about cosets. So, yes. Can the word over there be reduced in strong extreme property, or is that not necessary? Let's see. I think I didn't write it, but again, this was in March. So, let's see. Just so that I'm sure. Um, I think it does not need to be reduced. Yeah. According to the book. Yeah. Okay. So cosets. What is a poset? So now, now things get fun. Uh, a poset, and this is short for partially ordered set. P stands for partially, O stands for ordered, and set stands for set. And uh, okay, so this is a pair. P comma less than or equal to, where P is a set. And less than or equal to is an order relation which is called a partial order. Uh, okay, so this is a relation on P that is, well, let me say intuitively what it is. It should be some ordering of P, which is partial in the sense that some elements might not be comparable to each other. So it's possible for you know, neither element to be bigger than the other. Uh, but formally, it's a relation that is, first of all, reflexive. Okay, so what does reflexive mean? This just means that uh, x is less than or equal to x for all x in P. It should be anti-symmetric. This is saying that if x is less than or equal to y, and y is less than or equal to x, then actually x and y should be the same thing. So if x is less than or equal to y, and y is less than or equal to x, that implies that x equals y. And then finally, it should be transitive. And this should mean that if x is less than or equal to y, and y is less than or equal to z, then that implies that x is also less than or equal to z. Okay, and we will write uh, x is less than y if, well, this just means x is less than or equal to y, but they're not equal. So it's like x is strictly less than y. Um, I guess I'll start drawing examples maybe next class, but let me give uh, some simple examples of, or one simple example. I guess. So it 
chain is just another word for uh, a totally ordered set. means is that for any two elements, either x is less than or equal to y, or y is less than or equal to x. Okay. Um, we will say, okay, let's define an interval. So for, oh, maybe I should also say, uh, oftentimes I'll say, let p be a poset. And the assumption is that there's this underlying re relation, but I might not always write it. Um, this is kind of like when you say let G be a group. Well, formally a group is like a pair where you have a set, comma, some binary operation satisfying some conditions. Usually people don't say like let G comma dot be a group. Usually they just say let G be a group. Similarly, I'll do this with posets. Uh, so for X and Y and P, uh, such that x is less than or equal to y, uh, the interval between x and y is, so I'll denote it by bracket x comma y, and this is just the set of all elements in my post set such that they are between them, so between x and y. So x is less than or equal to z is less than or equal to y. And we'll say y covers x if the interval between them has size 2. This is just the same as saying that the interval between them is just the elements x and y and nothing else. There's nothing between them otherwise. Yes, yeah. Oh, um, I was just going to be like, can we see some examples of posets? Like, do they connect to the coxid group stuff? Yes, uh, we will do this. We will. So we're going to define partial orders on the coxid group. I think I'll define, certainly the strong group order will be the focus of chapter 2. There's. Um, the weak order is the focus of chapter three. I think at some point I'll define something called the absolute order. And there are other ways that we can connect posets with coxer groups as well. Um, so yeah, we will we will get there soon. Maybe ne yeah, probably next class. There are also interesting ways of thinking about posets as like combinatorial objects that are associated to the symmetric group, and there is a way of generalizing like this definition of a poset to any constant group in a sort of nice way. I don't know how much I'll talk about that, but maybe I will. We'll see. You can do it in section. Yeah, okay, you could do it in LA could do it in section, yes. Um, let's see if anyone can solve our problem. That was stuck up as a warm up. Yeah, as a warm up. Okay. Um, oh and okay in this case when y covers x uh, so in this case, I'll write uh, x less than with a dot y. So this less than with a dot just means x is covered by y. And OK, so there's a nice graphical way of representing a poset, which is called the Hasse diagram. Uh, or at least this makes sense for like finite posets, which is most of what we're going to talk about. So the Hasse diagram of P is the graph. How did I write it? Uh, okay, I'll just say uh, yeah, it's a graph representing the elements of P as vertices.
uh, with cover relations or maybe I should, yeah with cover relations x covered by y represented by an edge between x and y with x drawn below y. Okay, I realize now that this is very uh, verbose, but uh, it's actually not a very complicated concept. So I'll give an example, and I think that makes it clearer, and then I think we can end. So let me just give, um, let me give two examples of posets, or Hasse diagrams of posets. So here's the Hasse diagram of some poset. This is a chain with four elements. All right, so the elements are represented by the four vertices, and it's drawn in the plane so that like this element is at the bottom, which means that it's like the smallest in this order. This element is less than this element, which is less than this element, which is less than this element. So it's actually a total order. And um, I'll draw one more poset. Okay, so this is some poset. With six elements. some random post that, that I drew. And so in this case, like this element here is less than this element and this element and this element. But in this case, we have pairs of incomparable elements. So incomparable just means neither one is bigger than the other. So for example, if I took this to be x and this was y, then x and y are incomparable because neither is bigger than the other. Yes, Alex? Are those two that are sort of on the same level? Oh, yeah, those are also incomparable. Okay. Yeah. So x is incomparable to y, x is incomparable to z, z is incomparable to y. Um, yeah. But I could also say, like, maybe this is a. a is incomparable to y, but not with x and z. Okay. Could they be, like, equal? Or does the quality have to be Oh, yeah. So they're not equal. Um, right. I mean, I, I'm representing them so that, like, distinct vertices do represent distinct elements. Okay. Is that what you're asking? And in a post set, the quality has to be yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah, so it's like, it's a set, and you know, equality just means that they are like literally the same element of the set. Okay, so I think that is all for today.